Welcome to the Supply Chain Management Briefing. This briefing is about the art of the possible principles and how it ties into the administrative production machine. And also an example of what an administrative production machine is. I will go through more of this throughout the briefing. If you want to hear more about supply chain management, please go to my website listed below. Now the art of the possible is a theme that General Litchfield from the Air Force Sustainment Center uh, coined back in 2012. He wrote a book called the Art of the Possible. In that book he talks about managing people and developing them. He talks about management of resources, improving processes, and when you're improving all these processes and managing people, the tenets that he uh, values was valued was speed, safety, quality, cost effectiveness. At the same time you wanted to uh, envelop uh, teamwork, society, accountability, you wanted to gain respect and earn respect from everybody around you on your team. Uh, a culture of transparency, credibility, and of course engagement, empowerment of the people. All of those are facets of the art of the possible by General Litchfield and his team. That being said, let's get right to it. The administrative process that I'm going to talk to you about is called the D200 file maintenance. I'll explain what that is in just another slide. The art of the possible, how we tie that into some sort of administrative process. Gated process overview, what each piece of the gate actually means and why the machine is the way it is. Some potential benefits for, for file maintenance or any process for that matter. And then finally I will give you a machine detail overview, so an actual in-depth overview of my process. First, let me explain my administrative process. I'm in an organization that has over 13,000 engines, each with 6,000 unique different NSNs, national stock numbers. It's just another word to say part number for uh, anyone outside of uh, the gate, the base, I should say. Every year we're projecting buy requirements of over $500 million. We're repairing over a billion dollars worth of assets and we terminate contracts. That's something that we do for our everyday job. We're always managing these types of functions, all administrative functions that sometimes take a very long time. Uh, overall, we have six different flights with 175 plus or minus civilian and military personnel. Now we have a comp cycle called the D200 comp cycle. The key word is cycle. It recurs over and over again, four times per year, three month intervals. And the key to this bullet is it's repeatable. Any type of process that is repeatable can be refined down and make uh, put it into the art of the possible, make it a production machine. As long as you can find something that repeats, you can make this happen. And I guarantee you, if you look hard enough, almost all administrative jobs have a repeatable process. You can have multiple processes within that that repeat as well. The point I'm making here is that this is a very complex organization with a lot of inputs and a lot of outputs. Um, there's many different types of duties assigned in this organization. Equipment specialists, item managers, production management specialists, your loggies or program managers, you have supervision involved, and those are all the internal parties to this machine. We also have external, and I'll get into that here in a little bit. The fact is, though, any production machine will always have room for improvement and for making better efficiencies. Before I get into the gated process, let's talk about some of the art of the possible principles. This isn't exactly quote for quote from the book, but a lot of these tenets here correspond with the book. So the production machine should become a tool that you can actually use. Let's just put it that way. If it's not usable, then why, are we, why, are we, why do we have it? Why do we put resources into it? So this tool that I'm about to show you is going to allow you to apply lean principles, find root causes of problems, find constraints, find out what the bottlenecks are and try to pinpoint them and it gives you room for process improvement initiatives right there on the wall very transparent communication up and down the chain of command this wall this production machine and I use wall interchangeably with production machine because it used to be on our wall <clears throat> the communication channels must be open you must have good business relationships with all of your potential um, customers all of your coworkers, all of your external entities that are involved because we're going to talk about single value stream and how that's important instead of functional areas of excellence. You must communicate. You have to have 
ammunition to give to your leadership so they can communicate externally for you and help you. This is also a teaching aid. Anybody that is brand new to the supply chain organizations can use this wall or production machine as a teaching aid. Follow the steps and it'll give new or relatively new personnel an in-depth look of the big picture, why we're doing what we do, and it empowers them. And that leads to the next tenant here, empowerment. Um, if you find problems with the, the production machine or you find a way to refine it better or you find things that need to be added to it, empower your people to actually make a change to that wall, make a change to that production machine. It's a very crucial element to this production machine is to get involvement from the ground up. Part of the art of the possible principles is to get involvement from your workers. This is not a top-down program, this is a bottom-up program. And as the bottom goes up, the leadership is supposed to guide us to become more powerful and make this thing work. And of course, we're going to have a standardized process of how we actually do our processes to eliminate deviations and so forth. And we'll get into that as we go through. This is a uh, refined, this is a very abstract file maintenance production machine, or any machine for that matter. What you see here is that box that says file maintenance production machine. That's the whole machine. There are inputs into this machine. There is one output to the machine. So you can have multiple inputs, but this particular machine has only one output. Most mathematical formulas or functions has multiple inputs and one output. This is the same way. Within this machine, we have a gated process. You see how we have gate one, two, three, four, arbitrarily how many gates. It just depends on the workload. If you can break down your work into different focus areas or scopes, and you can naturally have breaking points, those are good positions to start your gated process. So gate one might be, you know, do this particular task and then you're done. Gate two, that gate two relied on gate one's output. So as you can see, there's arrows for every gate. There's an input criteria and there's an output criteria for every gate. I cannot start gate two until gate one has given me the output. I cannot start gate three until gate two has pushed the output to gate three and so forth. And the ultimate end goal is to have the output of the whole machine to be as efficient and powerful and um, without errors as much as possible. And this particular machine, the file maintenance production machine, our output is going to be, I want the most accurate requirement we could possibly get. Within these gates, there's flow time. Every single gate has a starting point, like a position of zero, maybe zero day through 10 days or whatever, how long the tasks take. It could take minutes, it could take hours, it could take months. It doesn't matter as long as it's a repeatable process that you do over and over again. Some of the benefits that we've gained from using something like this is uh, we do have that standardized process for everybody. Everybody knows what their job functions are. If there's a function within these gates that does not attribute to the output, you've got to ask yourself, why are you doing this um, particular task? Can we eliminate this task completely? In fact, or can I automate it? Can I, uh, can I make it smaller? What can we do to make it more standardized and fluid? The whole goal of doing that type of thing is to gain intellect time. If I'm too busy doing mundane tasks that do not attribute or contribute to the output, if, if I'm not doing those tasks, I'll have more time to look at bigger picture tasks to find the real dollar savings and the real uh, accuracy uh, maximizing that I can possibly do through continuous process improvement events, CPIs. You want to minimize all the workload you can get that's mundane. You want to automate it all if you can. Or eliminate it. Like I said, this wall or production machine is there for your involvement and empowerment. Empower everybody to make changes to this wall. Empower them to brief the wall. Empower them to know what's going on with this production machine. The involvement portion. Uh, if if a new co a new worker comes in and he sees a process that needs improvement, and he comes up with a solution slap a sticker on this dynamic production machine and say look I want to start a CPI event or a rapid improvement event on this particular thing because this 
uh, you know, Joe Smith, John Smith, has discovered a better way to do it. So let's get the team involved. By the way, John, that goes on your uh, resume as a good bullet. So we're going to save time and manpower. It's going to give us more time for intellect time. At the same time, everything is going to be transparent. I recommend a suggestion board for every production machine that's going to be uh, utilized. Again, our benefit is we're going to have a more accurate forecast requirement at the end of the day. Okay, now we're going to dig down into the details of each individual gate. Now, it's hard to do on a slideshow, but the, picture this as a 8-foot wide, 3-foot tall poster board going all the way across. What you see here is you have a gate name. You have gate 1 called data valida validation. What I'm doing here is validating the data that I'm able to gather before I get to gate 2. I know ahead of time because of the nature of the job that gate 2 requires some inputs. Um, but if I can start gathering that those facts and getting ready to input in gate 1, gate 2 will be all the smoother because all I'll have to do in gate 2 is actually input the data. So what we have here, it's, it's a little hard to tell, but on the top you have flow days and on the bottom you have calendar days. Now these are notional examples, none of this is actually true in real life. The flow days is how many days it takes to do this particular work task. So in this case, 28 days. In our case, or this case, it's dictated by policy. So that's an external source that we don't have control over. So if we can do this task in 10 days and we can prove it to our management over and over again that we can do this, all of this in 10 days, maybe we can change policy or find a new method to decrease the flow days so that we have more time for intellect time, which will eventually lead to cost savings big time. On the left hand side, you have the file maintenance job tasks down at the bottom left, and you see external factors at the bottom, PMS, ES, and item manager. You can group these within job function or not, but uh, the flow is kind of, it shows you the flow at the top. D200 comp at the very top, it says, um, Saco products loaded to SharePoint, IRL updated. So once that's done, then follow that arrow and it goes to prepare cycle products and so forth. A lot of these are contingent upon the thing before it. So they do have to happen kind of concurrently or one after another. That's the whole idea. Now the entry criteria for this is based on policy. Remember I said every gate has to have an entry and exit criteria. The entry criteria for this is all the data from maintenance, all the data from headquarters, all the data has to be aggregated and input into the system. Once the data is available to us, then our gate can open. We can start analyzing that data. Figure out if the data is garbage in, garbage out. If it's garbage in, let's fix those problems right here in gate one. And so forth. The exit criteria for this particular gate is when all the data has been analyzed. Now we're on gate two. What we have here is a process on the very top that if you find where it says start on the left hand side there um, we're taking our work in progress our WIP which our WIP is NSNs national stock numbers like I said they're just like part numbers think of them as part numbers um, but it's not the actual part it's paperwork that goes with it data lots of data so take that one NSN out of thousands that I, that I uh, mentioned before and ask yourself, are there any changes required to any of this data? If yes, then you must do file maintenance and make those changes. And then you can print, sign it, and you can finish that particular NSN, one of thousands. If it's not required, then you sign it and you, 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 know, you staple it, you file it away, you do all these things. Now, this is a thousands foot view. You know, I'm not going to tell you how to you know, staple it and open the drawer because there's a lot of Six Sigma initiatives within here that can definitely help this out. Anyways, everybody's got a process they have to do within gate two. All the ESs, item managers, loggies, everyone has their process. The key to gate two is you have to rely on external factors. If you, if you look to the very bottom, I have external factors down there. One of them says factors printed. We must actually get these printed, a physical product, right? We don't print them. We have an external company printing them. I think it's another agency called DAPS. If they don't print them in time and give it to us, we can't start on day one. Our flow days show 22. We could start on day maybe five when we finally get them printed, right? 
or the um, if you look to the right, they'll say RCO slash TCO review. So if the RCO or TCO reviews it, that's in not in our hands. That's in a different work basket. That is outside of our production machine, outside of our organization. And so we have no control over that. The only control we have is we can prove and show that, hey, there's some sort of bottleneck at the RCO, TCO level. Not, they're not getting it back to us in time on that 22 flow day. So we give that ammunition to our leadership, and leadership will try to figure out what is it they need. Do they need more manpower, more training? What kind of help can we get them to make our production machine better? The key to these production machines is the external dependencies are part of um, your single value stream. And so it doesn't matter if it takes 10 days at the RCO, TCO level. It still affects your machine, and you're ultimately responsible to the customer. The customer doesn't care about the RCO, TCO review. They just want their product at the end of the line. So we must work together, break those barriers, build those business-to-business -business relationships, and get the job done so the customer can be extremely satisfied at the end of the day. And for us, we want the most accurate, timely um, requirement we can possibly get at the end of the day. Now, like I said, this is one NSN that has to go through that. Multiply that by the 6,000 NSNs that we work every cycle between the squadron. Gate three, this is called I, I coined this term extended flow for the file maintenance side. I, I stole it from maintenance. In maintenance, if there's a problem they didn't predict was going to happen, they might send material to an extended flow to get repaired or fixed uh, somewhat uh, separately from the rest of the production machine, so to speak. Well, we have the same thing. Ours is called gate three final. And what this all is, is it gives you more time dictated by policy to make those changes that you're supposed to make in gates in gate two. So if you didn't quite get it done, you could do it in gate three, which there's a couple day window where there's you can't do any work between gate two and three, dictated by policy as well. And the limitations of the technology is what it is. So therefore, policy you know created those rules, business rules for us. So with that being said, what we're doing is the same thing we should have done in, in gate two. But maybe you made a, mis made a mistake in gate two. So now you're doing quality checks as well. But what if you pulled that quality lever and you really took care of quality in gate number two? You wouldn't have to do gate three and double check your work, triple check your work, right? And if you eliminated deviations in the process and you eliminated extra work that doesn't help us with the re re uh, accurate requirement, then we would have more time and we could have got all the work done in gate two. In fact, the whole point of this production machine is to push things to the left. Why do we even need gate three? Other than the fact that the technological, the technological limitations and policy are, are producing this gate three. And we utilize that for sure because we need that time at the moment. We must find ways to improve this process to have the quality lever pulled on gate two so that we never have to do gate three. Gate four, it's called the summary gate, or the um, <clears throat> this is where you determine um, if anything's going to be terminated or buy, repair, excess. Ultimately, the final answer is gate four. But what we're doing here is we're doing the same quality check we did in gate three and the same quality check we did in gate two. You see the problem here. We're, it's not that we're not doing quality work. It's that there's not enough quality systems in place to check the work as we go. So now we're going through finding any type of mistake we might have over, overlooked or just something like that, right? So we have gate four, which on the, in this particular case, it's 24 days long. And that 24 days is used to correct mistakes or to input what-if scenarios because things didn't get processed correctly in the other gate. But like I said, this gate is very similar to gate number two. If we push this back to the left and we kept going with it, why do we need gate three and four? If we got rid of gate three and four, I could focus on different efforts. If gates three and four wasn't there and I didn't have all this paperwork to shuffle through and find and sort and file and triple check a quality check that should have been 100% guaranteed in gate two, I would have all those days to nitpick and find big project, big money ideas to help the Air Force save money I could, I could use all that intellect time. I call it the human asset. That's our biggest asset we have. We should utilize the human brain to find these huge money savers or efficiencies that we're overlooking. 
Some more external dependencies, I, I'll name them since it's on the slideshow. Uh, we've got contracting, you've got policy offices, you have engineering, you have RCO, TCO, you have defense logistics agency. These are all things that we have to rely on. Now, it doesn't mean it's anybody else's fault. It means that we have to dive in and open up those communication channels and find out why, why these things are occurring. Another thing about this machine is any time that you find a bottleneck or an error, what you can do is you can figure out if you have enough manpower, figure out if you have enough training. Maybe the rework in gates three and four are because in gate two, you have a new hire that's working it and hasn't been trained properly. So maybe we need to engage in some more training. It all encompasses the leadership model. Everything within these gates must help produce the output, which for us is a accurate requirement. So that's a lot, a lot of information in this little bit, but it'll all start to make sense when you create your own. And just remember, administrative lead, administrative functions, most of them are repeatable. Just find big processes you do and dive in that direction first, and then break it out into sizable work chunks, aka gates and see if it makes sense for your organization to do something similar. With that being said, I will take any questions. Like I said, email me. I'm Mark Gingrass, and my website is on the very front of this. And like I said, I appreciate the time, and there's more supply chain type material on that website. Thank you.